Okay, so uh, welcome to a to the seventh segment lecture for this CRPD course. Um, this is supposed to be a second lecture related to implementation and monitoring, and I I felt that I pretty much covered the main points that I really wanted to get across last week. So I still have, you know, I, there's a few things that I can talk about from my own experience in this work post, you know, post, post adoption of the convention and especially as I've gotten into you know a more comfortable phase with the jurisprudence of the CRPD committee clearly accepting the premise that forced treatment and forced hospitalization and substitute decision making are prohibited it, there's been um I've been able to turn my attention more to the possibility of what can I get done in my own country in the United States, even though it's it's clearly very difficult. There's a lot of obstacles as there there are really in most countries. So I think what I want to do is is I'll see, you know, I'll talk a little bit from the slides that I have, some of which is also from from uh, from the spring that I, the same, the lecture that I did in the spring. And also, if we want to, if people want to, we can go over more of what's on the CRPD committee website, or um, there's a few other initiatives that I included in the slides that, that we can talk about perhaps in a little more detail, or if you have any questions or, or things that you want to bring up. So maybe that question that you were putting in the chat, we could, we could also just deal with if there's time and if it's, well, or you know, or or just leave that for later, as we said. So, um, this may be a short lecture. I'm not sure how this is going to go, and I will try to give some some more information from a more experiential point of view of some of what I've done and what I what I know is going on work by other people. If any of you are involved in implementation and monitoring work at the national level and, and you, you want to speak and, and you want to have the microphone, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Just remember that it, that it is being recorded and I, and I hope to be able to, to make it public, publicly available. So we can think about that. So as I, I said, there's, I'm going to, this is pretty much focusing on a more experiential and concrete aspect of implementation and monitoring. Last, last, um, the last lecture in segment six was 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 from the point of view of what's available. What does the CRPD say? What is what does the committee say about its standards? How does the committee work? And this time, I'm going to focus a little bit on what what I've been doing, what I know from from personal experience of implementation and monitoring and related work and what I know that other people have been doing. And I would welcome any of you, if you have experiences that you wanna share and you wanna ask for the microphone, you can do that and just remember we're being recorded. Okay, so.
on going to the slides. Okay, so I'm going to just start with talking about the program of work of the Center for the Human Rights of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. It's a it's an NGO and a DPO, DPO in the sense that it's it's deliberately and intentionally run by users and survivors of psychiatry. The board is required in our bylaws to always have a majority of members who are users or survivors or people with psychosocial disabilities. These are all, in my view, different ways of representing parts of the same experience. Some of us identify more with one than another, but it's one constituency of people with disabilities. And um, so this is an organization that, that I founded in 2009 with a couple of colleagues and of which I have been the principal uh, person doing the work. We have also had volunteers from time to time with shadow reporting and, and other kinds of activities. So the I, I set out a program of work for CRUSP when when we were starting out that I that I still really adhere to. And it was when I showed this to a funder, her reaction was that it's way too broad. You can never do all of that and you have to narrow it down. And that was impossible because um, <clears throat> I really wanted and needed to, to do all these areas of work, or at least to set out that these are all the areas that were necessary. And this is how this is what I wrote up in 2009 or 2010. So it's at an earlier stage, seven or eight years ago. And some of the things and, and, and some of what, what I, what I planned in there is, has been relatively set in place. So we're moving into other areas. So I set out five areas of activity, which are planned, needed, or um, ambitions. I, I don't even have all the words in there. The first was to build consensus around the interpretation. That is essentially global advocacy work, the work of advocacy towards the CRPD committee, um, promotion of a certain point of view around the fullness and equality of human rights and people with psychosocial disabilities and what we considered to be the correct interpretation, which as, as I've been saying, the CRPD committee has at this point substantially agreed with. It, it also, in this area, building consensus around the interpretation also involves work with other treaty bodies, other UN human rights mechanisms, academics, and a lot of the work that I have done and that CRUSP has done <coughs> And that, and, and that I did as part of, um, as, as a representative of the world network of users and survivors of psychiatry when I, when I was representing that organization, a lot of the work that, that any or all of us are doing around consensus on the interpretation has been not so much initiatives that we're taking has been more responding to initiatives that other people are taking that are that are coming about as a result of the advocacy that we did on the convention and the fact that that certain of these articles and provisions are considered controversial because they reverse the course that international law had previously taken especially on articles 12 and 14 and and 15 if we take 15 as 
um, addressing also forced psychiatric interventions as a serious form of violence, as torture and ill treatment. Although it's not in the text, it's been part of the the concept and the advocacy around that and the um, the work done by Special Rapporteur on Torture Manfred Novak in particular and others shows that that there is um, that there is that um, issue there. So these issues have been considered controversial and there have been many initiatives taken by actors in the UN or academia to to um, to look into them to to question and so and and to promote the the CRPD interpret to promote essentially to ask civil society to ask DPOs of users and survivors of psychiatry and others working in the field, you know, what, what, how do you see these human rights issues? So, so the process has been consultative in that way in, in the UN in particular and, um, and 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 then it also involves getting in, it also involves some of the other activity areas as well so for instance the next one is law reform and if a country or if ngos in a country or if the or the government is undertaking law reform on legal capacity or on the issue of deprivation of liberty if they are considering to repeal a mental health law. We need to ask what, or, or more likely they're considering to enact a new mental health law that violates the convention, but say they're considering law reform in general and they want to, they, 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 they consider law reform as an area that they have to work on to implement the CRPD then that also involves how are they interpreting the CRPD. Now we have all the guidance and interpretive tools from the committee. We didn't have that um, back in 2009. And even now, there are, there are many instances where governments and academics and NGOs promote an incorrect standard. So an example is, on the Mad in America website, which which has blogs by numerous people, I'm one of them. I commented recently on a post written by someone else that was <laughs> that was discussing a study done in Ireland about the experience of involuntary hospitalization as coercive, asking people if they felt coerced and how they felt about being coerced and various other things. And in, in, in the introduction to this post, the writer said that Ireland had enacted um, a particular law and that it was supposed to be that was they were doing this because of the need to comply with the CRPD, and 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 mentioned that involuntary hospitalizations can result in human rights violations. That I consider to be an erasure and and uh, and uh, and misleading and really misdirecting because if you are saying involuntary hospitalization can lead to human rights violations, you're not acknowledging that involuntary hospitalization itself is a human rights violation. And indeed, the, 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 uh, the, the study itself completely seemed to ignore its own findings on coercion and made conclusions about stating the need to find 
other ways to, um, uh, to, to find ways of coercing people that they wouldn't feel so bad about. So, but my point here was about law reform and how if you start out with the view, if you start out with an interpretation of the convention that says involuntary hospitalization may lead to human rights violations rather than involuntary hospitalization is a human rights violation and so is forced treatment and so is substitute decision making and all of the other kinds of abuses and violence that can happen when a person is deprived of their liberty in a psychiatric institution. Law reform really depends on the interpretation that you're basing it on because it will either be um, an act of implementing the convention or it can be an act of violating the convention. So still, the, the area of law reform is something that is important to get involved in, that's important in my view for, for any um, DPO of people with psychosocial disabilities or any allies, it's, it's obviously necessary because the law has been a primary area where our rights have been violated, has been a primary instrument of violation of our rights. So where there's a mental health law authorizing deprivation of liberty and forced treatment, we have to repeal it. Where there's laws on legal capacity that say people with psychosocial disabilities are legally incapable or can be deprived of their legal capacity if they're shown to lack an ability to make reasoned or reasonable decisions. That's a kind of a functional capacity standard. We have to repeal those laws and we have to create a new way of, of framing legal capacity in law so that people with disabilities are treated equally as others and have equal decision-making rights as others. So, and, and, and there are often many other legalized discriminations in areas such as voting rights or parental rights that, that we need to address um, if, if people with psychosocial disabilities are going to enjoy full and equal human rights. Um, and, and these areas have been the, the focal point of a great deal of advocacy of the user survivor movement. So clearly law reform is needed and often the question is how to do it, how to build the political will. I wrote up a, a short statement once identifying four challenges, four areas of challenge. One is political, essentially building the political will, crafting some political messages to link up with, with people's values and, 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 um, essentially I think with people's values and important principles that may be in some sense culturally variable, but, you know, off, but, but, but non-discrimination for instance as a principle or bodily integrity and, and that sort of thing. <coughs> or simply the equal worth and dignity of all human beings. And a second area is technical. What does the, what does the legal framework look like in general around the issues we're talking about? So in general, how does, how does a particular legal system treat legal capacity? Where are the points in the law that we have to go in and change something and how does that change need to look so as to remove all of the provisions that remove the autonomy and rights of people with disabilities and provide for needed support and accommodations subject to the person's will and preferences. That is is technical because it requires legal knowledge, legal expertise, legal drafting, 
And it's also obviously political and a matter of principle that um, you also you need people who have a good knowledge of the CRPD paradigm to be directing the lawyers so that they know what they are applying their technical skills to do. And people can be in both roles, especially some of us who are survivor lawyers who are very involved in human rights work can bring both roles, but, but we need to, 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 um, to clearly do that, to bring both of those capacities, whether it's in the same people or, or people working together from different roles. A third area is the practical. A third area of challenge is the practical for, for law reform. Men, we, people may raise the, for law reform and policy reform. So people may raise the question, well, what do we do? What kinds of services and supports do we provide for people with psychosocial disabilities? Yes, we're going to take away coercion. Um, we're going to, we're, and, and we understand that the medical model is, is seriously flawed. What are we going to do instead? What does the human rights framework, the paradigm we've created in the CRPD, tell us about the kinds of services that that make sense in a human rights non-discrimination social model of disability framework? And what what do people tell us simply from lived experience? And how do we put those things together? So there's that practical dimension and the practical, practical obstacles to creating support should not be, or practical challenges or questions about creating support should not impede the abolition of coercive practices. In my view, I think, you know, the when when something is an act of violence you 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 go to stop it immediately and you're not questioning <clears throat> the first order of business is to stop the violence and not to to go into what are the roots of the violence and what is what is the victim you know what should the perpetrator do differently i mean i i don't even know how to frame it properly but um i think we need to clearly address the violence as violence, and at the same time to acknowledge that the existing mental health system grew up in part, I believe, as social control, but also in part as to, to meet people's actual needs. And how do we separate the social control from the meeting of people's needs? And what, then what do we want to do for real to meet people's needs. Okay, so that's the practical. And then the final one is the philosophical. And I think I see that in two ways because I, I think what it really amounts to is, is doing more work than we have done on explicit development and articulation of philosophical underpinnings for the CRPD paradigm, for the paradigm that says, yes, autonomy, yes, support, and autonomy, and support cannot interfere with autonomy, and we have to be providing support and accommodation for the exercise of autonomy that, that they interrelate with each other and, and that essentially support is always in an auxiliary role to autonomy. Otherwise, support becomes something that's not support. So that's one way of saying it, but there have been various attempts so far, not enough in my view, to articulate the CRPD paradigm on Article 12, mostly from a perspective that centers people with intellectual disabilities, 
that is addressed to concepts of personhood not being limited to a certain level of cognitive ability and also linked to the concept of interdependence. And I have written a little bit about this, but, but I believe a lot more work needs to be done theorizing the CRPD paradigm of legal capacity from a psychosocial disability perspective, from a perspective of people with psychosocial disabilities, users and survivors of psychiatry, and when I start looking at that, for me, it also amounts to a feminist perspective as well that, that questions the way the legal subject is constructed in law, not just as the idea that what's called reasonable is the perspective, you know, paradigmatically the perspective of a male person, but also concepts of responsibility and free will and how people experience themselves as legal subjects. Are you aware of yourself as someone who has legal rights and legal powers, or do you experience yourself in your own life as someone who is at the mercy of other people's will? And is it revolutionary for you to even think that you might have human rights? And in my experience, in talking to people, in talking to users and survivors of psychiatry about these concepts, it's, it's been often especially a revolutionary thing for a number of women who are users or survivors or who are who are survivors essentially to survivors in the sense of surviving psychiatric abuse of some kind to have been in a in a situation where they did not experience themselves as people who had any power in the world legally or socially or politically and the concept of human rights as a tool was especially revolutionary and that's true for some men as well it's not black and white but but for me that kind of sense of legal disempowerment and questioning my own status as a legal subject related to gender hierarchy and gender as oppression as well as uh as well as the experience of having been subordinated by psychiatric abuse so those are challenges that that I can I can share that um short paper I think it's one page with the class as well but that came up for me when I was involved in in consulting in various ways about law reform so so far in my work and in the work of Cruss Law reform has mainly come up, not directly that we've been involved in changing the laws in the United States, but rather being asked to consult, to give advice. Here's a new mental health law. Tell me what's wrong with it. And the, the short answer is everything. And then I can go and, and comment and, and also looking at initiatives on legal capacity, some of which I've considered viable and credible, others not so, and, and others mixed, as we talked about in segment three on legal capacity. Now, there is a, a bill in the United States that I think has potential that, that um, I'm starting to work with people around. And also possible efforts at the statewide level in in a couple U.S. states with with user survivor groups there. So that's the second area of law reform, monitoring and enforcement. That's that's obviously necessary to hold the state accountable. I, I I'm using the term monitoring to mean 
shadow reporting and related activities, engagement with international or regional human rights mechanisms, and enforcement really when you're going to a binding court or, you know, to the extent that procedures such as the communications under the optional protocol are adjudicatory, that could be considered enforcement. But um, if we, in the strict sense, if we're talking about courts, what can be done with, with litigation? <laughs> so that's an area that's, for CRUSP, really still to be developed, the enforcement part, but certainly it's something that I'm aware other colleagues are doing. My colleague Hege Orafelen in Norway has started a pro bono project, training lawyers and then overseeing them and training law students uh, in in work that that will bring is bringing cases to challenge forced psychiatry in the Norwegian courts and also involving themselves with with um, human rights mechanisms as well. The next area is education and awareness raising. I think in many ways, I mean, that's critically important. I would divide it in, in a couple of different ways because education and awareness raising directed to users and survivors of psychiatry ourselves is really critical because without the involvement of people um, on the ground, people in, in DPOs, people who are currently being subjected to forced treatment and other related violations, we need in every, in every country, in every locality, the dimension of lived experience to bring content and 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 um, definition to the 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 general principles and to engage with these general principles and 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 really decide okay how is this relevant to your life does this work for you is there something missing and so we 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 all in the international work need to be open to that and at the same time to be able to push back against criticism that's coming from a perspective of simply you know accepting forced treatment there needs to be that that continual engagement and definition of ourselves as a movement in a sense of where is the advocacy going what can the advocacy accommodate how, when is there simply opposition and disagreement? But I, I do believe that education and awareness raising in the survivor community is critical, giving people the tools to use the convention to, to work on the abolition of forced treatment in their own communities, in their own countries, and to work on whatever other aspects of the CRPD are are important and meaningful to them. So that's one aspect of education and awareness raising. Another is building the capacities of significant actors, whether it's in your local government, the judiciary, the legal profession, academia, um, human rights mechanisms. There's there's quite a lot of education and awareness raising to be done because this is still a relatively new paradigm. Luckily, as we move forward, there's more and more people who are joining, who are um, who are building this with us. So the CRPD committee. And its work has been has been the most important development, 
and how the CRPD committee members and other UN human rights experts go out into the world and promote promote these issues and, and the paradigm. For instance, Catalina de Vandas, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, in her country visits and reports on her country visits. The Working Group on Arbitrary Detention has, has been taking this on, Special Rapporteur on Health to a degree, and et cetera. So the more actors become involved in this, the more the whole area of education and awareness raising expands. And at the same time, I particularly feel that there's a necessity to keep coming back and maybe coming back to this question of building consensus around the interpretation and um, the different challenges related to law reform and policy reform. Um, how are people interpreting the CRPD and the CRPD paradigm in their education and awareness raising activities? Are they actually in the name of CRPD education actually taking a stance that would still allow some kind of forced psychiatric interventions or some kind of coercive paternalistic interventions by the state, which, as, as I've argued, I consider to be contrary to the CRPD, any one of those. <laughs> and so there's the need for education and awareness raising, and for those of us who, who um, care about a, the, the paradigm that comes from a survivor perspective to, to really continually be, be monitoring all the different aspects of work that's being done, including the work by civil society, and to continue to look for opportunities to do more education and awareness raising. You know, sometimes people are not necessarily People are not necessarily open to it, or it's difficult to find the platforms. This class is certainly an example of, of, of bringing education and awareness raising to any, anyone who's interested. So that's, that's another one of the important areas of activity. Also, sharing information on social media and websites and blogs, the CRUSP website has resources pages, and um, I write on various blogs and social media. So that's an, an email list. It, it can be an, an important tool, even this level of, of relatively informal education and capacity building. And at the same time, I, I am increasingly aware that the informal work is not having as much of an effect as I would like, and the formal kinds of education that are being conducted in universities and generally by actors that are not survivors themselves or in institutions that are not survivor-led, that... Um, are 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 often given more credence and <clears throat> and taken up excuse me as um as they, they're often they, they, those are often more influential than the informal kinds of education so i think that's that's still a need once in a wnusp meeting um, I believe it was Annie Robb coined the term survivor institutes of knowledge for what we need. And that's something that I'm very committed to creating more of, supporting and creating more of this dimension and really kind of enshrining survivor knowledge as a perspective in the legal field 
I have called what I do critical disability perspective, but from a specific survivor of psychiatry, from a specific survivor of psychiatry point of view, and similarly to how feminist jurisprudence and critical race jurisprudence have been conceived and fairly respected as standpoints, um, I think that we need to, to see and promote the same in the legal field. And specifically survivor knowledge, because survivor research we have seen um, in, in other fields, not so much law, but we need it in the legal field and we also need for independent scholarship to be, to be promoted and for universities to be, to be more open than they have been to survivor knowledge and, and um, perspectives. Extending the analysis is a fifth area that is I, I I included because there there have been and still are some initiatives in areas of international human rights law that strongly affect people with psychosocial disabilities or where the paradigm that we created in the CRPD is is relevant and needs to be extended. And the two that the, the two that, that I've really been involved with are the standards relating to the treatment of prisoners and and the whole area of of prison and criminal justice generally and also the rights of older people. So as I, I think we discussed the the standard rules on the treatment of prison standard minimum rules on the treatment of prisoners was revised. It wasn't it 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 it, it still has some conflict with the CRPD. Um but the CRPD is a binding treaty, so so that that's still there, but um, the rights of older people. There's a process ongoing to to develop a treaty on the rights of older persons through the UN, based in New York. So extending the analysis, extending the CRPD paradigm to the to, to ensure that particularly older people have have the right to legal capacity on an equal basis with others, have the right to keep enjoying their legal capacity and not be deprived of it, and have the right to not be institutionalized, to live in the community in in a situation of autonomy and and independent living in the sense that they are in control of whatever supports they're getting and and their own decisions. So those are that that's that's the final area of activity and these are these are areas that that I set out as a a program of work for CRUS Center for Human Rights of Users of Survivors of Psychiatry but it's also what I think is necessary in general for the survivor movement um, doing work on CRPD. CRUSP works in three geographical dimensions, global, local, in the United States, essentially, in the United States or statewide here. Um, Also regional at times in the sense of the 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 organization of american states although my country is is not very um active in the relevant procedures there it's still there are some regional consultations and that's more similar to the global advocacy i would say um and also international cooperation working with 
with DPOs and allies in other countries advising or collaborating on projects where we've been invited to do so. <laughs> and, and I've also divided the programmatic work into the, the areas of advocacy, furthering theory and practice, and capacity building more focused on, I guess, the education and awareness raising, but more focused on building the capacity of other people to take up to take up this work in their own way and often they can often they go they they go together so for instance involving involving other activists who may be new to the CRPD or new to the human rights framework in shadow reporting is a way of building their capacity as well as, um, you know, it's, it's as well as being simply a concrete advocacy project. So I think it's important to think about those, that, that there are many ways that, that these things can be combined and go together. And just example of what we've been of what I've been doing now uh, in the U.S., we've had a we've we've just had a country report from the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention with specific recommendations saying that involuntary treatment and involuntary institutionalization of people with psychosocial disabilities is prohibited, and recommending that the U.S. enact an enforceable right to live in the community and receive services free from coercion or restriction. <laughs> that is language that I had proposed to them that links up with a bill that's being proposed in the U.S. Congress. And the bill itself may not be perfect, it may need a little bit more work, and then there will still be a question of how it's interpreted by the courts. But it is, it, this is a way that I am hoping that there, there is a real synergy created from the, the, the human rights monitoring that we, we did with the, with the working group on arbitrary detention the engagement by um, by survivors with the working group when they came on their country visit, and how we 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 also shared written information with them. So linking that with actual domestic advocacy, promoting this the bill that's called the Disability Integration Act on the right to live in the community. That's, that's a bill in the U.S. Congress, promoting that, promoting it in the user-survivor community, raising awareness about it, talking to lawyers about how we're going to troubleshoot potential flaws in that bill, what, what else we can all think about to really work together on having on on actually the goal of abolishing forced treatment. So it's been very exciting to start some conversations in the United States about this and to have a few organizations so far, but significant ones, really wanting to, to take this up and work with it. Um, and I can say for, for it's, it's been, for me, it was, it's, it's been, I, I think it's challenging for everyone to, to put these, to, to, to put the CRPD paradigm and principles and, and requirements into national law. There's so much that has to be 
figured out in terms of strategies, allies, politics, resistance, opposition, you know, level of awareness in the user survivor community, and that it it feels like it's a it's a difficult process of getting the wheels to turn and hopefully we are going to start this wheel turning in the United States. And we had done shadow reports before to a couple of different treaty bodies. So far, what we got from the working group on arbitrary detention is the most specific that actually says to the United States that forced treatment is prohibited and that they they need to enact this enforceable right to, to live in the community and to have services free from coercion. And I think that makes it more concrete for people here, more concrete than the the um, the general materials that have come out, Cer certainly the materials from the CRPD committee, people will say, oh, well, you know, how can I go into court and enforce my CRPD rights? And then you have to say, well, the U.S. hasn't ratified, and when they do, you're not going. You're still not going to be able to go into court. But at least here, we have an actual, concrete recommendation from a UN human rights mechanism that I am hoping can can start something in motion. So. Similarly, um, well, I was going to mention also my friend uh, Hega in Norway, similarly what she has done quite a bit of shadow reporting through the organization, with her colleagues in the organization, We Shall Overcome. It's the oldest psychiatric survivor organization in the world that's ongoing, having started in 1968. And um, she's, she's done quite a bit of shadow reporting, participation in government consultations, and through with WSO and also with the ICJ branch in Norway, International Commission of Jurists, the, the Norwegian branch has supported her work very strongly and there's in particular there was a retired supreme court justice who's part of that um ICJ Norway named Ketil Lund this is a man who who has has opposed forced psychiatry and wrote dissenting opinions about this when he was a supreme court justice and he has supported Hegge's work and, and her pro bono project there. So she has a different set of, of circumstances. She has that strong support from a legal organization, from a very prestigious legal organization, as well as um, a, a long-running National Psychiatric Survivor Association. Norway is also a much smaller country than the United States, and they have the 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 national government is much more accessible to the people in in terms of doing consultations and convening commissions to consider law reform where they include psychiatric survivors who 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 act who have a strong point of view or allies who have a strong point of view and so there and and so i i would say that in in each country you really have to look at what you have to work with and um and you know i can look at i can look at norway and say oh she has these great things to work with and she might look at the united states and think about some of the good things we have here that that i might not be seeing because to me i'm i'm more, I'm more focused on the obstacles another couple of examples in france 
There is a campaign that I started, the Absolute Prohibition campaign. It started last year asking people to, to, to simply write some kind of blog posts uh, related to the CRPD standard of absolute prohibition of commitment and forced treatment in mental health services. And <coughs> um, with that, coming out of that, that was very successful. We got, it, it was a way to stimulate people to actually think about the issue for themselves, not just to say, yes, Tina, you're doing a great job, you know, share, not, not just to share the work that CRUSP was doing or that WNUSP was doing, but for, for people who are supporting this to really think about it for themselves, see what they could contribute as a meaningful perspective. So there were a lot of contributions from survivors reflecting on different aspects of their experience. There were three contributions, four actually, by people that were memorials for someone who was killed by forced psychiatry. There were contributions from lawyers, researchers, one from a, a clinical psychologist. That was very successful. Following that, we created a, um, an email list and phone calls and now a Facebook group for people who want to continue to stay in touch and network with each other in the promotion of absolute prohibition. So in France, members of the campaign, there, there had been a number of people who contributed on the blog posts from France, and many of them hadn't known each other. So they were able to get together through the Absolute Prohibition campaign, and they advocated the first thing they did was connecting with the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Catalina de Vandas, when she did a country visit. They, they met with her, I think, in, in a few different cities, shared a whole lot of information with her, did a lot of work for that visit, and now they're trying to see what else they can, they can do to consolidate and build and, and work within the country for, for law and policy reform. Also, in, I've been working with activists and lawyers from Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. Now there's someone from Hong Kong who I believe is also going to work as you know on f for this to be for her country as well, <coughs> working to draft and promote a model law on inclusion that could work for these countries. And the idea of a model law on inclusion is really to to, to put in the CRPD paradigm, focusing on what does it mean to fully include people with psychosocial disabilities in the community? And of course, part of it is to abolish uh, forced treatment and deprivation of liberty and substitute decision making. So how are we going to how are we going to frame such a law? What 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 would actually be the content and the focus? Does it have to do all that work? Does it have to do legal capacity law reform? Or is that something that we would signal in this law and then uh and then and then flesh out at a later stage? So far we have had two meetings in Korea that have also been accompanied this last time by a public symposium. And so this work is, is going to proceed. And, and it's, it's very interesting. And of course, I learn from this kind of process by being involved with it as well. There are some other things that um, I, I, I'm a great admirer of the law reform initiative that was <laughs> that's still in process, still being promoted in Peru. 
Uh, my colleague Alberto Vasquez, who's a survivor and a lawyer, was it was in a leadership role with this. And what they did is they created there they they created a two stage law reform because the country and the, the all the dpos they they were intent on enacting a a general implementation bill for the crpd and so they wrote into it they they put the text of article 12 into the bill and they wrote into it a plan to create a law reform commission to actually change the civil code so that the civil code, which deals with the question of legal capacity, can actually be, be transformed to, to abolish or repeal the provisions that deprive people of legal capacity based on disability or a functional approach and to ensure that support and accommodations are made available and that such support respects the rights, will, and preferences of the person. And so then they, they, did, they convened that commission and Alberto was, was a member of it. They, they had civil society representation along with government officials and I believe judges were there, legislators, and and um, uh, administrative agencies as well. I believe, and they and and their proceedings were recorded as part of the the package to to share their draft text of, of the law reform. And it's very interesting to read it in full because you see the development and you see a little bit of the arguments and the, and the reliance on general comment number one being brought in as, as a way of explaining what it is that this is supposed to accomplish. And I think in particular, one thing that's important is the best interpretation rather than best interest principle in cases where, in, 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 in the cases that everyone acknowledges to be an extreme situation, such as a person who's in a coma, what do you actually do and how do you avoid putting someone outside the framework of legal capacity? saying they don't have capacity. And so we discussed this in segment three, the best interpretation standard and when and, and, and how the best interpretation standard should be put into practice. So this is part of, this is also part of what they, what they put into the, Peru, the, the Peruvian law reform proposal. And I think to me that stands as the best example of how to actually put the full CRPD paradigm into law. I mean, the full CRPD Article 12 paradigm into law, following the general comment, following the key features of the general comment and the key principle, autonomy, support, and support has to respect autonomy. <coughs> So I, I, I very much hope and wish that this will succeed to be legislated, that they will succeed in, in obtaining the, the approval from the legislature and not change the bill, to n not water down the bill. There have been improvements that were suggested, but that they should not, um, they should not water it down in order to get it passed. It's nevertheless, it stands as this is what, this is what really article 12 requires. Um, in India, I think they had an interesting process 
to conduct civil society consultations where they were bringing together various stakeholders in a number of different cities and to to build a public awareness and public support for changing the paradigm and and among the actors they brought together were family members of people with intellectual disabilities i'm not sure if family members of people with psychosocial disabilities i'm not sure possibly as well and the i think the process was is something that was interesting there they did in the end um enact a a not a very good quality law reform and activists with psychosocial disabilities rejected the compromise that was made on article 12 there so i think that's important to know also they accepted the the promoters of the law accepted an inferior standard on article 14 that i think i mentioned but i think it's it's valuable to look at these different initiatives and i i would encourage everyone to 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 think about to look at whatever might come your way to think about it critically what can you learn from what people are doing in peru or india or norway or mexico i'll mention that one also that um what can you learn from them what do you think they what do you think they might not be doing correctly but what 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 do you think is worth learning from i'll, I'll tell you there are many many law reform initiatives that i do not even bother discussing because i consider them to be essentially a kind of co-optation essentially a kind of diversion of the energy of law reform for the crpd into something that's not really even a credible attempt at complying that is that is just the same old procedural safeguards standard for legal capacity or or um mental health commitment and forced treatment that existed before the crpd and you can't in my view it's not right it's not morally right and it's not right from a human rights standpoint to use the crpd as a kind of prod to accomplish these reforms that we've rejected as as a human rights standard and that continue the violations in place so <laughs> i think that there that there is room for different kinds of ways of thinking about if we can't get the full the full package of what we want or there are ways we can make compromises that don't give away the whole thing um and we may different activists may have differences of opinion on what it is to give away the whole thing so for instance on article 14 i think it's never acceptable to allow it to be written into the law that they're using a solely standard that they're saying um there shall be no deprivation of liberty based solely on disability when we know that that word is designed to allow the continuation of forced um of mental health commitment and that that was explicitly rejected during the CRPD negotiations so there's certain we have to look at what people are doing we have to examine it critically and we have to see what is inspiring to us in mexico the organization documenta was doing and and I say was because I haven't been in touch with them for a while but they were doing a a a program of litigation in the country public awareness raising and media <coughs> complaints under the CRPD optional protocol relating to the abolition of inimputabilidad which is a a um a mechanism by which people are declared unfit 
to plead and unfit to be held criminally responsible. I believe it's it's both of those together. And so they they were promoting the CRPD standard, wanting to give people the right to stand trial, to abolish the detention of people on security measures being held as people who were not who were not able to be criminally tried or be held criminally responsible. And <clears throat> I mean, I, I put down on these slides some various things that I, that, that I had thought were lessons that I think are useful from shadow reporting and law reform from examples I've thought were, were um, inspiring that other people were doing. And I'm not sure if I really want to go through them. I think at this point I would like to, to open it up and see if anybody has questions or, or um, anything to contribute. What are you thinking um, about the... Any thoughts about your own situation or <clears throat> what you would find helpful from me at this point? The slide with confidence of the government. Okay. We'll do one one person at a time. So the slide with Okay, this is on <coughs> Okay, so um I, I, I was going to Emmy's first. Do you want me to unmute you, Emmy? And just remember that we're being recorded. Hold on, I just have to get there. Um, attendees. Oh, are you you're still thinking? I was trying to unmute you. Well, shall I read the slide and just see, read it for everyone and see what, what it's um, bringing up in people's thinking? So this was what I was thinking about what is necessary or helpful to do law reform, confidence of the government. I'm trying to keep the chat window open at the same time as the slides. That's what you're seeing. So. Confidence of the government, meaning meaning some relationship with the government that people that a good working relationship with the government is what I mean. That if you're actually going to do law reform, you need to have a relationship with the government or with key people in a particular party who are going to promote what you're trying to do and who have a chance of getting it passed. But this may also be something that develops over time. So some colleagues that I'm talking to um, who are thinking about doing something on a statewide level in the U.S. are thinking about are thinking about the promotion of a, a essentially repeal of, of the mental health law as a long-term strategy so that, so that you're not going to have the confidence of government or legislators overnight. And, and I hear you saying it's not possible in the UK after the disability community challenged them 
the UK may be a very specific case in the way legislation and I mean, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll ask you about the UK in a minute. In the US, the legislative and executive branches are considered to be separated and they are functionally separate and they're supposed to each have their autonomy. So the legislatures here would not necessarily experience themselves as being threatened if um, the executive branch was challenged, but they might, you know, it might, it might slide over. And that's something to think about is how to, how to deal with the monitoring and enforcement in relation to law reform. Sometimes you need that, you know, sometimes you need to sue the government in court. And, um, <coughs> and, and in the U S that has been possible that people sue the government in court and get a good ruling. And, and, you know, it doesn't, change the 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 possibilities for cooperation so but by confidence of government i really just meant um being able to develop good working relationships either with ministries if they're doing consultations or legislatures people in legislatures who can you find in these bodies of government that could be an ally and i think it does seem to work best in in small jurisdictions so even in the us within individual states i think smaller states have a better possibility than larger ones, but I could be wrong. <laughs> that, that may be too much of a generalization. I'll just go through the rest of this, and if, if there's anything you're thinking, you can let me know and I can unmute you, or, or then we'll go to the next question. So civil society leaders with a clear strategy, I keep trying to get this, the words, with clear strategies and understanding of the CRPD and its principles. So you might have a government that's, that's all keen on implementing the CRPD and they might have the, <coughs> they might have the best faith in the world, but if you don't have civil society leaders who really understand and want this to happen and, and have a vision of of what needs to be done and what they want i think that's that would probably be difficult also you know how are you going to implement something that is geared to essentially liberation from oppression of people with psychosocial disabilities if people aren't advocating if people have not understood what the potential is um, for for this situation to be changed. So that's that's what I mean there about civil society. Um, creative solutions to build consensus. This is something that that in sometimes can be more of a process value than something you have to have in hand. So, I mean, in a sense, creative solutions, well, we do have some creative solutions that the CRPD already sets out, like supported decision-making as an alternative to the paradigm where either you are considered to be a fully um, you know, someone who has it all together in their life and doesn't need any help and nobody's going to question their judgment, or you're somebody who is vulnerable to having your right to make decisions take away and somebody put in place to take charge of your life. 
that supported decision making is a creative solution. And then we have to make sure it's understood that support really means respect for the person's decision making and not some kind of midway, like we'll, we'll, we'll only take away half your legal capacity. But so creative solutions can also be thinking on your feet and how to, how to mediate between different, different needs and different political realities that you consider legitimate. So for instance, when I was in one country doing a presentation about, I, I, well, about Articles 12 and 14, and someone who is a user and survivor of psychiatry raised a question that she was very concerned about doing away with forced treatment. She felt she really couldn't envision herself in a situation in a state of psychosis and, and how anybody could respond to her other than forced treatment, that she wouldn't want the treatment, but she thinks that she should have it. And so in that case, I talked about advanced directives, and I talked about it giving my honest opinion as something that's not really a great solution that I, st I think is problematic if you're going to allow people to bind themselves in the future, if, if, if you're going to allow a person to say, I now today authorize that if I am ever in a state of psychosis, by which I mean this, 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 that I want, I want somebody to take me to the hospital and have me injected with Haldol. Then what happens at the time, it's, it's going to be forced treatment. What happens at that time when you say, you know, now I don't want it. I don't want it. I've changed my mind. Yes, I know I wrote that in the advanced directive, but I have my legal capacity. Aren't you going to respect my legal capacity? Aren't you going to respect my right to be free from, from torture? I think it's going to be very problematic unless people are essentially thinking through what they want and, and unless that is actually turns out to be what they want in the situation and they don't end up, um, they don't end up contesting it, you know, because it's, I think it's going to be a very difficult <coughs> situation legally to, to deal with. Um, and yet at the same time, that is a potential compromise solution. The CRPD committee has talked about advanced directives as a, as a supported decision-making option. And they don't specify, yes, you, that you can use it to, to authorize forced treatment, but I think they do talk about it as something that expresses your will and that can bind your will in the future that you're supposed to set out at what under what circumstances it comes into effect under what circumstances it would cease to have effect and so essentially it does allow people to do that to create a time in the future when their decision making will not be respected i do think it's problematic but i think it can be a practical, possibly temporary solution, something to consider if there are people who, from their own personal point of view, want to use it for themselves. You know, I do really think it's problematic, and I think it can also end up tending to legitimize the whole concept of forced treatment. If, if a person can do that to themselves, why can't somebody else legitimately think this is a good thing to do to them? You know, but again, creative solutions, I think if it's a choice between staying with 
a mental health law that simply allows forced treatment and moving to abolish such a law, but allowing people to make the choice for themselves through an advanced directive, I would take the advanced directive as a compromise solution in that case that could build consensus. And then lastly, disability movement coalition <coughs> with an integrated platform and mutual solidarity, that's kind of idealistic in, in many respects. In many of our countries, the disability movement is, <coughs> is fragmented, competitive within itself, and not especially welcoming to users and survivors of psychiatry. But where you have that possibility, it's very powerful and very strong. I'm thinking of the example from Peru, where there was such solidarity and there was that ability to create a solution to build consensus by not trying to do the whole reform of the civil code in the initial CRPD implementation bill, putting it in, putting Article 12 text in there and saying this is what Peru supports and is obligated to, and then postponing the, the technical details of the reform for a later time. I think that was a reasonable solution that maintained solidarity of the disability community. And we, we had similar kinds of instances happen in the, in the drafting and negotiation process of the CRPD. So that, I don't know, more comments. Do, do we wanna to go to the UK now and, and give Andrew the mic? And um, let me find where to do that. I think you have to do something yourself, Andrew, because it says I can send unmute request. But I, there you are. Anything? Yes, I hear you. Okay, so you know you're being recorded. Go ahead. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Tina. I'm sorry that I've missed a load of this. I couldn't work out to do that thing out. So I've actually, I actually tuned in at, at what I thought was the right time and it was right at the end of the lecture. But anyway, what I wanted to ask was, um, I gather that 92 different countries have ratified the CRPD and the optional protocol. Is there any way um, that you or others could think of that survivors in those 92 countries could take collective action through through like i suppose what i'm asking about is is it possible to launch class actions through the crpd with survivors and users of psychiatry in the other 92 countries that have ratified and also use that collective strength to lever to get ratification in other countries Um, I don't think you can do a class action under the optional protocol of that nature because it would have to, because it's against each particular country, you know, that what's survivors in the UK are addressing what's going on. I mean, I know in some countries where they have class actions, you can have a whole class of plaintiffs against a whole class of defendants. And in that case, <laughs> we would have to have the whole class of all survivors in all countries that have ratified the optional protocol against all countries that wear forced treatment and commitment are practiced, which is probably all of them. I don't think there is such a provision. 
Um, is, is there any way that that, that, that sur users and survivors in other countries could support a class action by survivors in one country against practices in that country? So if if um, survivors in the UK <laughs> wanted to organise a class action, could they pull on the support of users and survivors in other countries that have ratified in their class action against practices that are, be, that are being um, undertaken in this country? Okay, I think, I mean, I'm not expert on the optional protocol and um, we have someone here, I don't know if she's able to speak publicly, but um, I would have to defer on, you know, I, I'm not an expert in the procedures relating to the optional protocol. So that's, it's the, the actual procedures and what can be done with the optional protocol itself formally I think I would need to to research and investigate further, but I do think we can, I mean, okay, one thing, maybe what you're talking about is the question of amicus briefs or third party interventions, which is something that can be done. So if there's a UK survivor who makes a complaint under the optional protocol and Again, can you make a complaint from a group of survivors? Can, I th I'm pretty sure you can ask for you can ask for systemic remedies. Right. I, I you know again I I'm not expert in the procedures of the optional protocol. So, but if you have a survivor or a group of survivors in the UK, who the the main Obstacle is often exhausting domestic remedies. Okay, so you have a group of survivors or showing that you don't have to exhaust the domestic remedies for some reason. I think there's, I've, I've done some thinking and, and um, I did a third party intervention in one case that makes a, makes a little bit of an argument but i think there's there's a lot more research and thinking that could be done on this question of the fact that all people with psychosocial disabilities in a country that practices forced treatment are are at risk all the time um, by these laws and are discriminated against by these laws and should not have to go through a process of being committed and, you know, even like, really like even those of us who aren't currently locked up, I am threatened by the existence of these commitment laws because I know having had a psychiatric commitment history I mean, anybody is vulnerable, but somebody who has a history of being seen as a person with psychosocial disability, even if I don't experience myself as um, having any particular disability right now, I am more at risk. So I think there is the argument that, that these laws, the existence of such laws puts us at risk and we should not have to go through anything of exhausting domestic remedies, um, challenging them in, in a court, et cetera. Um, but there's a lot of legal technicalities to be, to be addressed, both in terms of the, the exhaustion of remedies requirement under international human rights law and, the, and how it, it actually relates to the procedures available in any particular country. So it's a good idea. You, you, you really need to have some good legal people on your team in the country, if at all possible, when you are filing such a, an individual complaint under the optional protocol. But let's say you have a survivor in the UK or a group of survivors who files a complaint under the optional protocol, 
they can invite third party interventions. I would suggest it's not a good idea to make it something that is, you know, like a petition or like saying just inviting everybody to express their support. It's more that you might want to ask people who have a particular perspective and information and knowledge that would be helpful for the CRPD committee committee to consider when they are looking at your complaint to submit a third party intervention. Don't barrage them with with things to read. You know, really think carefully about what kind of third party intervention would be useful. And I think on a more public or massive I'm just going to mute you so I don't get the feedback, and then I'll unmute you again, okay? That's fine. Um, so I think that there can be a coordination and campaign and, and you know promotion, getting people together who want to do these things. I actually tried to do that, um, you know, but at one point and I'm certainly interested if if you or if you want to take an initiative I think it's a good idea to coordinate and to discuss strategy and and what's needed one of the issues is going to be the different language groups but there's certainly you know in there's certainly a number of English speaking countries. Well, I don't I mean I know in English speaking countries there's Australia and and UK. I'm not actually sure what else, but there's a number of Spanish speaking countries and also France. So I know we have English, French and Spanish. Um and you know I, I think yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure there's other English-speaking countries as well, even if it's not where English is, it may be English not as the primary language, um, but as an official language. So I'm sure we can, um, and I, you're asking, can, can the committee help with strategy, or do you have to seek that elsewhere? I mean, the you can... You can meet with the committee secretariat and ask them general information that they could that they could advise you about, but they cannot help you with with specifics of a particular case. I mean, they are in the role of the impartial arbiters. So there's, um, I think, I think this is something that, that we could certainly talk about and, and I'd be very interested in talking, talking with you about, um, often the people who are actually doing the work of filing complaints and, and doing litigation, often they're very busy and, um, it's hard to to get them to stop and to stop long enough to to come and strategize with with other people who are interested but let's let's see what we can come up with 